So, hey, everyone, this is Josh and uh, Josh and John. We're just going to let a couple more people get logged in here. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, so, yeah, we're here because we chatted. Josh and I chatted, what, it must have been June or July, I want to say, something yeah. like earlier during the year. COVID was having an effect, but we didn't have, you know, nearly the cases and the deaths that we have at now. Um, there was a little bit more guessing about where things were going to go. And, and you guys were doing your best trying to figure that out. We were talking to our clients, our employer groups, trying to explain, you know, explain what's going to happen. Uh, there's been a lot that's gone on this year as it's unfolded. And then now with the vaccine starting to get um, spread out, you know, I've got multiple friends, nurses and doctors who are getting the vaccine this week. So they're getting the first of their two doses. And so that's a real thing. We'll, we'll you know, be, we're moving into 2021. So the question is going to be, what kind of effects did that have? What things are going to be around moving into the future and what things are going to stick around that were, you know, things that really popped this year, which of those are really here to stay and which of those were really just a small blip in the radar and we're not going to see them moving forward. So, um, yeah, how is, uh, how is your Q4 been, Josh? Have you guys been busy? Uh, it, it's been interesting trying to, I guess, the first three quarters of the year, obviously nobody saw what was going to happen in quarter two getting into COVID. I think a lot of people freaked out in healthcare, which is rightfully so. We should, all should have. I did. I mean, I have four kids and we're now virtual schooling all four of them. That's a life change. Um, with yeah. <laughs> going to fourth quarter, I mean, third quarter kind of seemed like things were getting back to normal. And we'll kind of talk about that a little bit in my some of my projections is it felt like maybe COVID was going away. And then now we've got into the fourth quarter. And as of this morning, ICU beds in Southern California seem to be at 0%. And uh, the numbers are going up like crazy. But uh, overall, I guess, We've had the pleasure of working with insurers, with self-insured, with brokers, with everybody to try to help look at what's going on. And I guess I don't want to give away my whole talk, but the healthcare costs related to COVID haven't actually been as bad as we would expect it. And uh, mm -hmm. 2021, I don't think we need to sound the alarms as bad as some people uh, did. Like back in March, I often like to go back to this. Uh, somebody was predicting actually not, I shouldn't say somebody, but a major uh, public entity was predicting 40% increases in cost it, for 2020. When we look yeah. at it now, most people have actually experienced a reduction in cost. So that's uh, just, it shows how little we knew and hopefully we know more now and going into 2021, I, I have a pretty uh, positive picture to paint, but there still is, there's some hur hurdles to jump over. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we had the conversation with some groups that, you know, were saying like fully insured models, and they've been considering going self-funded. This year was the year that those self-funded groups really saw their costs go down because utilization was down. But, you know, that's not a trend that we anticipate staying around for the long term. So, you know, it's, it's going to be somewhat back to business as usual, but it's going to be, you know, the classic new normal where we're back to a normal, but is it not, it's not really the normal that we had before. There are going to be some of these things that stay around it and affect life moving forward. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and share um, share your slides. I actually, Let me do that I really quick. Version. Can I share these ones or do you have other ones? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, go for it. Sorry to drop down the last second. <laughs> Let me know if you see them. Yep, got them. Okay. Well, uh, I guess I'm gonna to try to run through these pretty quick because uh, I mean, hopefully we'll have more conversation, but uh, today I'm going to hopefully talk about COVID and then also the total cost of care. That is something I keep on getting asked and some people are like, well, what the heck is the total cost of care? It is the total cost to deliver care. That could be, that includes admin, that includes medical costs, includes everything. And when we look at healthcare in general, we need to move towards lowering the total cost of care because at some point it, it, it's a point where it's unsustainable. Uh, this is just a little bit about who I am. I'm an actuary. I'm a math nerd. I took way too many tests and uh, uh, took about a decade to get fully certified as an actuary. But we work, our, our team, we have doctors on staff, we have IT professionals, and a bunch of actuaries where we work with everybody across the spectrum. Like, I often get asked, do, well, do you only work with insurers? I was like, I do work with insurers. I also work with providers. We work with hospitals and health systems. We work with brokers. We also work with clients fighting with brokers, so maybe I shouldn't admit that right now, but uh, <laughs> we, we work with everybody on all sides of this because we just want to help healthcare hopefully become more affordable for everyone. 
here's a quick like slide to showing some of the people we work with and uh, I, for what it's worth, there's some cool logos on there. But uh, here's a quick summary of how we're gonna, I'm hoping to do this today. Is I wanna talk about COVID-19 first and talk about the projections of costs that we've done. I also wanna end it on a positive note though and talk about some of the good that has come out of COVID. We all hear COVID and I think people wanna cry, people wanna run away, they wanna scream. But there really has been some positive in healthcare, especially when it comes to COVID. Uh, we're going to touch on care management. And when I talk about care management, I'm talking about managing care. Like you can look at, at, at uh, medical care as fee for service, which is pretty much a vending machine that allows you to get whatever you want, whenever you want it. When there's proper care management, it slows down the fee for service vending machine mentality and helps people decide what they need, when they need it, where they need it. And uh, that goes into a lot of uh, the, even the new legislation today with transparency and helping people decide what to do. I'm going to talk a little bit about some just easy, easy ways to lower healthcare costs. And then I'm going to talk about maybe just some advice to brokers and self-funded groups or could even be fully insured groups going forward. So um, COVID-19 findings, uh, when I had a last version of this presentation, I did, I guess, way back in June, these were, I, this title was actually slide early COVID-19 findings, and pretty much we knew nothing. Today, yep. uh, COVID has, has impacted the healthcare costs in 2020. We've seen lower, we saw low utilization, like you go look at uh, utilization patterns for healthcare in March, April, May, even into June. What, the, the, utilization was much lower, how much care was being consumed. Then we kind of hit like late summer into like fall, we started actually seeing payment rates, utilization rates kind of really creep back up into what would I would consider pre-COVID levels. So we had a dip, came back up and back to normal. Now we fast forward into December, which we're back to having very high COVID utilization. We're in lockdowns again, especially here in California. Hospitals are full, or at least ICU beds are full. So utilization of, I guess, voluntary things maybe is down, but we are seeing utilization where hospital beds are full. One thing in our projection we, we look at is required versus elected uh, procedures. Required, mm -hmm. required procedures are, if you have a heart attack and you need something done, like, like a cath or something done, in, you are required to do those. Required though, even through COVID, I can't say has been all the way required where some people are still putting off services that they need. Elective, like there's some things that would be nice to have, like you have a sore shoulder, a sore knee versus a completely blown out knee. Like those elective surgeries, a lot of those have been delayed. And one interesting thing we've seen a lot in elective surgeries and electors procedures, I should say, is some of them, have just went away altogether. Like people mm -hmm. like look, a good example I like to use on this one, and it's kind of a, a funny example is dentistry. Dentists were closed for a long time. It's not, and like if you get a cleaning every six months, and like if you haven't went for the last year, it's not like you can get two cleanings within a month. Like that electric <laughs> just kind of went away. Like there are other things, yep. more medical care, the same thing that it's like stuff you might've liked to do, but you might not have done. This next point, empty and full ERs. This one is kind of confusing because uh, when, when the COVID pandemic started, the ERs were really, really full. Everybody, if you got a little sniffle, you thought you had, you had COVID and then you went to the ER. As time went on, ERs actually became completely empty. My brother, he's a medical director in te Texas. He's an ER doctor. He, was, he said that the ups and downs of the ER with COVID have been crazy because it's went from uh, being completely full, overrun people down the hallways to almost nothing. And then it came back up, it goes up and down. And the interesting thing is a lot of ER issues, and as you, as you guys probably know, when it comes to costs, like healthcare costs, ER is a major driver of costs because ER is, is probably the most often pathway to get admitted into the hospital other than scheduled things. And, uh, but when ERs were empty, it wasn't because COVID all went away. 
it was because suddenly ERs were actually probably being used for what they should be used for. ERs went from a place where you go in for an ear infection or a runny nose where you shouldn't be there back to what an ER was designed for, for limb and life-threatening conditions. So part mm -hmm. of the empty ER has actually maybe helped show how ER should be used. I, uh, it's a family joke in our family that is, my goal is to make my brother make less money. But it is kind of <laughs> a little bit true because I, I mean, I'm not blaming it all on ERs and, I, and he's my idol, I love the guy to hit. But if an ER is used as it should be, my brother as a doctor is a lot less busy. And healthcare costs should go down because people are going to urgent cares, they're going to see their primary care physicians, not just going to the ER because it's convenient. Hospitals, ICUs are full, and then I in parentheses I even said empty, because it's kind of been it's been an up and down thing there too, where you hear about um, hospitals, uh, obviously with all the elective surgeries not happening, hospitals being empty. Then today you hear about them being full. So what does that look like in the future? We'll kind of talk about what we think for next year. One one piece of this puzzle that isn't, I mean, is starting to get talked about more and more is doctor and nurse burnout. A lot of doctors and nurses have actually seen their hours cut and uh, or pay cut, but some of them are working more than ever. It's kind of an interesting thing. There's some, there's less, like some people have walked away from the profession just because they don't want to deal with COVID where other ones, if they're paid on RVUs or paid on how much they do, they found that it's just not worth their time anymore and they've looked for other things. Or a lot of doctors and nurses, which I want to give them all pats on the back and hugs, they've worked hard even and worked extra or went to other cities like back when New York was having their problems, people flying from all over the US to help New York. Mm -hmm. uh, they have worked tirelessly and uh, there are a lot of burnt out uh, medical professionals. The pandemic has similarly impacted both insurers and self-insured, uh, big groups, small groups, everybody's been affected. Even if you haven't had a COVID patient, some groups won't, like you, you have been impacted in a positive or negative way. Uh, I'm gonna go, go to the next slide now and talk about our projection, but this projection to be realistic, I probably have to update it daily because things change so fast. But uh, we've tried to predict and tried to look at what's going on in healthcare and in claim patterns to see what we really believe next year will look like. But as everybody can say, no projection is perfect. I'm guessing. I'm looking in the rear view mirror of my car to try to see where we're going. I'm looking at the past of what's happened and guessing what is ahead of us. So this graph, and I'll try to I tried to make it as colorful and non-math geeky as possible, but uh, there's three colors on the graph. There's elective procedures that are the lighter blue. There are required procedures, which are the dark blue. And there are coronavirus, which is the green. As you'll see, the elective procedures in January and February of this last year were at a high level. They dropped off in March and forward. And what I'm predicting is by the middle of next year, June, July, we should be back to where we're fully running back at what we'd say normal levels or pre-COVID levels. And uh, the required uh, blue lines, I should actually put those at the bottom. They've stayed pretty constant. They have went up and down a little bit, but for the most part, things are required, life-threatening. They are still happening. Mm -hmm. What we'll see is the green COVID numbers, and this is COVID costs. They have kind of went up and down and like they started low in, in February, March, they got big. As we go on through the end of the year, you can see back October, like, like September, October, they started getting smaller. We still had them, we still have some people on ventilators, different things. And then in December, I'm kind of showing them peak back up. Now, December, January, I'm, I'm predicting this is gonna be the peak of COVID, December, and January, and it should start tapering down. And I'm hoping with the vaccine, with social distancing, with everybody being smarter about things by July, I'm hoping to say that green will go away. There is still gonna be some green. Some of that green truthfully is gonna be turning to dark blue because there is residual uh, effects of COVID that people will still be dealing with. There is uh, some stuff to do with heart uh, uh, problems that have been tied to COVID, lung problems, obviously, different things like that. But one thing I will show- Oh, go ahead. 
I was going to say, so yeah, so basically you're saying that you guys are anticipating the vaccine distribution is going to penetrate pretty widely. It's going to be pretty effective. And we're going to see that pretty much taper off a lot of the COVID stuff. I mean, even what is it? Even by March, you're seeing a noticeable decrease in uh, costs associated with it. So um, we're kind of thinking that we'll do a good job of spreading this out. Yeah, and I'm, I'm putting I'm putting part of that on a lot of that on the vaccine, a good chunk of it on the vaccine. I'm also putting some of it on what we would call herd immunity, which I, I know if you watch the news, some people say herd immunity is a joke. It, it's not. It's a real thing. When, but when more people are protected, like more people have the vaccine, it's harder to keep on transmitting a, a virus. And uh, so I'm putting some on herd immunity. I'm putting some of it just on the seasonality patterns of us getting out of the winter. And uh, it, it should be uh, getting better. Um, and part of it um, is even what I'm calling later on social health awareness. Like people hmm. are, are, we got a little bit lazy come fourth quarter. I, I, I did, I have to admit it, like we're getting together with more people or different things. And I think there's gonna be, be as people in January, February, March, I think some of us will start making even smarter decisions than even maybe we made pre-COVID of like, I, one thing I like to say is like, before when somebody got a cold, they're like, I got a cold and they'd still go about their life. Yes, we need to do that. But I think people now, it might be somebody might wear a mask more often. It might be like, they just like, oh, I probably should avoid that gathering. I think that's what I'm calling social health awareness is more people are making smarter decisions for the group. But uh, one thing you'll notice though, is if you look at this like $400 line, when you go mm -hmm. across it all, in the end, healthcare costs really didn't change that much with COVID. A lot of elective procedures were offset by COVID procedures and some uh, even uh, reductions in uh, required services help offset COVID. So if you look at it, our costs in general, if we averaged all those about, all, all those straight across, the costs really didn't change much. That kind of gets us into our next slide here is on the left, this is what I'm projecting for the next year. And there'll be like 5% of the spend will be related to COVID. If even that maybe even could be less than that. But the big thing they look at is when you add the five and the 22 to get 27%. When you look at regular costs, like this pie chart on the right, the, the 70, the 27 and the 26 are pretty much the same. So one thing, and this should make groups feel hopefully better and different things is if, or even insurers or whatever, but like I'm saying that I'll, pretty much the COVID costs, it hasn't been a new cost that we added to the cost model or to the total bucket of cost. It actually has been offset by things that were required and maybe didn't happen or elective things that didn't happen, lower utilization. So we will kind of get back to a normal. Now this often goes back to talking about pent up demand. Am I a believer in pent up demand? 100%. There are people that are gonna to have to go back and get things. Our projection is accounted for that where we're seeing, where we will see increases in required and increases in elective, but I really kind of, I'm predicting, and as I'll show on this slide, we look at the um, three, uh, I guess, scenarios. Uh, favorable, which could be like, it, let's say the vaccine is even more effective, it gets out faster, and everybody like wears a mask, stays home. I don't know, maybe not that, 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 that leads to other costs, but uh, like, that lower, that could mean that healthcare costs actually could go down 4% next year. Uh, hmm. If we if say moderately adverse, like let's say maybe it stretches on beyond June. And uh, maybe there, there's actually a piece of this um, where I say the vaccine is coming soon, but there's a social piece of this. And I think John just touched on that of who will actually take the vaccine. I get asked daily, will I take the vaccine? Like, Josh, you're in healthcare. Will you take the vaccine? And I, I tell them, and I'm not trying to push people or put any political agenda, is I will be the first in line to get it when I can. I don't see a reason to uh, put myself, uh, to not get it. I have four kids. I will get them vaccinated as soon as I can as well. But uh, do I believe in this vaccine? I do. But moderately averse, if people just shun the vaccine or it doesn't get, it, we're running some sort of hiccup, we could see an increase because it could extend COVID. But what I'm saying in the end is for, for 2021, I'm expecting due to COVID and due to just overall 
like and this this excludes medical trend this is just costs going up i'm expecting costs to go up by about one percent as an expected and maybe that's one percent that's one percent more than maybe would have been expected like so if you say medical trend might be three percent four percent whatever you want to say five percent six i'm saying most likely we should probably add a percent to that just to to account for covid and the lingering effects of it. um yeah this whole vaccine thing i don't want to be too long on it but like it it is a polarizing thing just like mass mm -hmm. polarizing uh vaccine seems to be polarizing i mean if we re uh, rewind two months our president was promising a vaccine and coming soon and nobody believed and it happened now we wonder if like will will it actually be effective or does it, it cause all these other side effects and i know some of that's yet to be seen but uh I was on the phone with our doctors that worked with us yesterday and he was pretty much debunking every negative thing they've said about the vaccine. And uh, he was just encouraging us that it, it is, yes, it happened fast, uh, but it is something that it looks like we can trust and should trust. Sorry for getting maybe political on that, but yes. <laughs> yeah, no, totally good. I mean, it's like, it's going to be something that, I mean, we've probably not had such a huge public health push for like mass inoculation against something like this, like since probably the polio vaccine, I would guess, right? Yeah. I mean, something that's getting, trying to distribute it so widely. And I mean, literally we're going to be administering like what, hundreds of million, you know, 100 million, 150 million doses of this thing, not more than that within the next like couple months. I mean, we haven't done something like that. It's one of the biggest undertakings we've had in the public health space in yeah. the, ever. So <laughs> it's definitely something for us to address. Yeah. yeah. I was recently talking with, uh, actually, we have close friends that grew up in Africa and grew up around Ebola. And mm -hmm. we look at that, and I know it's a totally different disease and totally different condition, and it, you can die in a matter of days, and there's all these things. But like, we have a lot to be thankful for there, too, that we're dealing with COVID and not Ebola. I mean, that, that's one thing that I, I even have to say, like, in these times of negative and COVID and all that, and it kind of goes in my next slide, but it's, there's a lot we can be thankful for that we're not dealing with something a lot worse. Uh, so good that it's come out of COVID. Medical testing. I would say that's one thing. It, uh, timing and cost. We've seen the timing of not, I'm not just talking about COVID tests, but we can use those as an example. Back in January, February, all that, like some people were waiting weeks to uh, get results from the COVID tests. I shouldn't admit, but we might watch some reality TV and there's a reality show where they had a person waiting two weeks for their, they were quarantined for two weeks until they got their results. <laughs> we still do a two week quarantine, but it doesn't often take us two weeks to get results. Um, and the cost, cost has went down dramatically as, as more people have got into the space and trying to figure out other ways of doing testing. This is also testing everything from diabetes testing to other testing. There's more at home options now because companies have had to pivot and help with mail in things and drive up and whatever. And the sheer cost of it, as more people get involved and just technology gets better, has been able to go down on many tests. Virtual medicine, this one is, uh, gets brought up a lot, but I think COVID helped us push the fast forward button probably five years. Pre, if COVID never happened, I think in 2025, we are where we are today on, on virtual medicine. Uh, this, there's yeah, some, I think that's fair to say. Some big numbers right here. Survey found that urgent care visits went up 700% on virtual for virtual means. Like uh, that was one survey, like there's, I've seen numbers even a lot larger than that. I've seen some smaller too, but like non-urgent visits went up 4,000%. Like, so they pretty much went from nothing to something. Like a lot of them, I, I personally am with Kaiser and within a, a few clicks on my phone app, I can make an appointment and see a doctor and we've done it multiple times during COVID. That's, it's been huge. It does lower the cost. Like we can look at like healthcare costs, like if the CPT codes uh, associated with virtual visits are less, but also just if you think about brick and mortar costs, suddenly doctors can work potentially out of their home if they wanted to more, do virtual visits, not have to have staff, not have to have a waiting room, not be paying rent. And uh, one interesting thing, I actually just got invited to be a part of association that will be announced real soon here but there is a whole new association of practitioners that are gonna be considered virtual first practitioners. 
So in other words, hmm. they aren't going to have an office. They are going to be virtual first and that's, you meet with them and there might be reasons that you get, I mean, obviously you get uh, referrals and go different places, but there is a groundswell of people that are looking at a whole new way of doing medicine and virtual first is, is going to be that they, that's not the name of them. I wish I could talk more about it right now, but I can't, but, uh, uh, one thing we'll, that, have to, we'll have to follow up and get that from you, yeah, I would love to. <laughs> but I mean, this, yeah, but this urgent care stuff, I think that that totally probably plays into what you mentioned earlier about your brother and just in general, this like complete seesawing effect on emergency room occupancy, because, you know, that's like always an issue in healthcare is how are people getting the right care at the right place at the right time? Yep. And so often it's like, yeah, you go to the ER because you got the sniffles. Well, that's a really high cost version like that's a really high cost way of getting care for something that you could probably get elsewhere and so it seems like telehealth has really pushed us in that direction but 100%. you know i don't know if you've saw, seen that this year but there's been these you know as soon as COVID hit and people started realizing how life was going to change you saw like you know the stock prices for zoom and a couple other related businesses just went through the roof uh, but then telehealth again like it has just absolutely popped this year. I, I Teladoc and Mavongo announced a merger and that's going to be worth like billions of dollars. Um, Live Health and another one also in Cloud Health, I want to say it was, they announced a merger that's also going to be worth billions of dollars. So you wonder if some of those things are going to come back to earth a little bit, but in general, it seems like a lot of hospitals are now trying to figure this out. Like, is it going to be hospitals add telehealth services and it still plays into their general business model? Or is it going to be these telehealth first about like companies that are starting with telehealth and that's their bread and butter but then they're going to need to figure out some way to also engage with that you know downstream care because if they're handling that top of the funnel when people have their first contact with healthcare, where is that going to be but then what comes after that so yeah. that's what like i'm very interested to see with all these because this year like i've presented more about telehealth to groups than we have ever before um, because people just want to know about it and i think they should know about it you know it's, it's a better modality of care if, if it's appropriate for people based on their, you know, based on their systems and what's going on with them. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think that suddenly we're going to become the Jetsons and have the little machine in our room and it's going to do all of our <laughs> care and then tell us to go to the doctor. I don't think brick and mortar is going to go away. I think hospitals, medical groups, insurance companies, like you already see all of them pivoting real fast and throwing money, throwing gas on the flames to get better at telehealth visits. Because let's be honest, even at the beginning of COVID, there were doctors doing Zoom calls. And now there's these great platforms where you can interact and message and all these things. So it is here to stay. One interesting thing is higher than expected adoption rates for the 65 plusers, the Medicare type patients. I, I know when I deal with uh, grandparents, like getting a text message to come through is sometimes a miracle. But to see uh, a lot of them now gladly doing virtual visits and uh, actually lowering some of their own health uh, concerns because they don't have to go sit in a hospital. They don't have to sit in a waiting room. That's been a kind of an unexpected. They kind of, when virtual medicine, I actually started working with a virtual medicine company back in the early 2000s where they were trying to break into the system. And people yeah. kind of laughed at them, didn't think it was going to happen. Microsoft actually adopted them full on. And this is early 2000s. This is almost 20 years ago. And they were doing virtual visits at Microsoft in the early 2000s because it might have been a work-life balance issue, but they couldn't get to the doctor. They wanted to work more hours. So they'd have quick visits there. And if they needed to, they would send in a, a, a physician to the office, come meet you in your office. And uh, But now that company, I mean, not just with Microsoft, but they're, they're, they got gobbled up by somebody else. And now virtual medicine is something that's normal. I, I, not too long ago, I remember having an orthopedic visit on my iPhone with my doctor. Like, that's awesome. Like, it wasn't very long ago and that, I mean, you have to be in an office to be able to talk through things and it, it works well. Another one uh, that, another positive of COVID, I would have to say is vaccine development. Yes, like Operation Warp Speed, like we got there faster. And I know this is a, some of the piece of distrust, I think, of the vaccine is how can we normally take five or 10 years and now we're doing it in nine months. But this is kind of, I actually heard a great analogy yesterday is if a home builder was able to put a hundred people to work on building your home, would your home get built faster? Yes, hundred percent. If you put a hundred people build the home and you're able to fund them all, pay them all, and you have all the supplies at your hand and demand, 
you will get your house built faster. And I think that's really a lot of what happened is vaccine development, they've been making lots of uh, huge headway over the last couple of years of new technologies, new ways of doing it. And uh, now when it came to this one is when there's a bunch of money thrown at it, federal money, uh, investor money, whatever money it is, they were able to put a hundred people to build the house. And that really is what mm -hmm. got there. They had people eager to be in the trials, like people signing up to do that. So this wasn't that we rushed it. It was kind of that we had the perfect storm to be able to do it quickly. So I hope that one is here to stay. Sanitation and cleanliness. This one, uh, I guess is, I'll touch on real fast, but is there are things now that I don't think people cared about sanitizing before and now they do. I recently went on an airplane. I've done quite a bit of flying during COVID, but I recently went on an airplane and yeah, it smelled like a nursing home, but that's because they <laughs> sanitized it. And I was kind of, when you get on and smell the sanitation, you're like, oh, that's like, you're kind of happy because you know it's been sanitized, but then it thinks of all the decades of years where it wasn't sanitized as, clo as closely. And I think that's a, a, a good thing moving forward. Uh, not just in airplanes, because actually, if we're honest, airplanes, really, we haven't ever seen an outbreak yet on an airplane, which to me still blows my mind when you put 200 people in a tight complete, tight place sitting right next to each other. But sanitation on airplanes, rental cars, airports, schools, like has, has taken a step forward, which should, should help us um, stay safer. Social health awareness. And uh, I, I didn't want to use the word social because that can get tied into social agendas, but I'm more saying social health awareness as we are now more, like I talked about earlier, more aware of our own health and how our health might affect other people. Like uh, my, my parents live next door to me. They're in their 70s. They are high risk for COVID. Social health, health awareness went way up for me during COVID because I knew that I could get it and be okay. My kids could get it and be okay, but putting other people at risk was not worth it. And I think in general, people are looking out for their neighbors more, looking out for friends, grocery shopping, doing whatever they can do to help other people. And that's been a positive during COVID. And delivery services, this one kind of sounds non-healthcare, but it really is healthcare as well. But is like, what can't we order to our house today? You can call DoorDash and have Chinese food delivered, or uh, you could have whatever, you could have every kind of food delivered. Not too long ago, you could have pizza. That's what you could deliver. Uh, you can also now order stuff from your hardware store and it's to your house within an hour. Like, but how does that help healthcare? Is There's plenty of people, lots of people that are housebound, can't leave their houses. And this is a change of life for them where they can now stay home, feel safe and order everything from a hammer to a hamburger. That, that is exciting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like I think there's, there's lots of other positive things that have come out. And I think there's a piece of it too, as much as we've seen like more infighting in our country between groups and parties and this, that, and the other, I do think in the end, there's parts of us that have come together even more where we're, we are really, we saw that when the whole, literally the whole US could shut down and we're still here and surviving. So do you, I guess before we go on, John, if you want, is there any more on these kind of things you want to touch on or? Well, yeah, the thing is, uh... Going back to the virtual medicine, the thing there that I'm interested to see, and um, I'm following a couple of groups that are tracking legislation on this, is that you know CMS early in the pandemic, they they loosened up restrictions on telehealth, right? So they started reimbursing providers for providing telehealth services to Medicare beneficiaries, and then just kind of that led to a cascade domino effect where a lot of commercial insurers started doing the same. Now the question is, okay, is that going to be permanent or not? And so I'm interested to see the legislation there if we're going to start seeing a permanent change in those rules to allow telehealth visits to be, you know, reimbursed on a commensurate basis with in-person visits, because I think that's going to lead some interesting developments. I think one thing is, you know, you can say pros and cons. Pros, it's going to lead to more telehealth, which, you know, leads to potentially lower cost of care overall. overall. On the other hand, it then just sets the compensation at the same amount as in-person visits. So it's not really lowering cost of care. It's just that if, you know, hospitals or facilities see that, well, we're getting the same revenue from in-person versus telehealth, but our costs are way lower for telehealth. We're just going to shove everything to telehealth as opposed to what makes sense from a healthcare outcome standpoint, right? So yeah. there's kind of these different effects and elements that I'm interested to see there. Um, the adoption for 65-year-olds and older, I think part of that is probably 
you know, I mean, my mom now is 68. She's pretty tech savvy. So I think it's a little different than maybe it was five or 10 years ago with that population. But with people having grandkids all over the country, I think a, a non-zero aspect of that had to be these grandparents who were like, I got to figure out Zoom because I got to see my grandkids. Yeah. <laughs> so I think part of that adoption had to be there. Um, and then the last thing I was going to say for virtual care is, you know, we know we have this primary care physician gap in the country. There's the gap right now. We know we're not training enough primary care docs to fill the docs who are leaving those ranks. So, like, I was just reading something talking about pharmacists and, you know, and trying to, you know, hypothesize how the role of pharmacists is going to change. So, like, one thing you could see is someone starts a virtual visit, you know, over the phone. They need some tests done. What is within a couple miles of, like, almost everyone in the country? A CVS a Walgreens, a Rite Aid, somewhere with a pharmacy, even like a Target or a Walmart, maybe those pharmacists become adept at doing some certain, you know, labs or tests or stuff like that. So, you know, you need a blood draw. It's probably going to be really inaccurate if we try to have that stuff done at home, but maybe that virtual visit directs you to that pharmacist. They get some stuff done for you. It's a lower way. It's a lower cost way of getting that stuff done. Yeah. Um, you know, and, I, my mom is a nurse. She's a nursing professor. So I have heard about nurse practitioner scope of practice rules for like years now. So I am interested to see if NPs get full scope in different states. There's a lot of lobbying done to prevent that. Yeah. But that's another push I'm interested to see because that would also have interesting implications for, you know, telehealth and just the overall process for how someone interacts and starts an interaction with the healthcare system and then how it progresses over time. So yeah, you hit yeah, a couple all that stuff is really interesting. Yeah, you hit a couple of good points there that uh, actually I had a slide that I took out, but I'll kind of touch on it a little bit is supply and demand in healthcare. Like if we took economics classes, supply and demand, it means when you have more supply, what does it happen? Prices go down. Now in healthcare, that is not always the case. Like uh, when, when you have more supply, it sometimes leads to costs going down, but most often what it actually leads to is utilization going up. We actually mm -hmm. did, a, we did a project up on, in the state of Washington, it was on the coast in Washington, where over a one year period of time, they saw an increase of 30% of providers in a certain specialty. And they actually, most of them moved from California up there. And uh, they started a new medical group. And it was a group that like, not just medical group, but a lot of them moved up there, but uh, suddenly they had a lot of supply of a certain specialty. And what they ended up noticing is it wasn't that the costs went down. It was actually utilization went way up. People started consuming more care. And in the end, they ended up with 20% higher costs, specialty costs in the area. So hmm. it, we have to have this equilibrium point where you have the right supply and the right demand and uh, or the right supply because that can lead to demand. Now, that uh, when, when it comes into telehealth, Yes, telehealth visits are cheaper, but are people suddenly now going to consume a lot more visits because they're easier to have? So we could have a supply uh, issue. And this is actually something I'm, I'm actually writing an article on it now, and I'm, I'm, I'll hope you probably be out in the next week or so. But is when it comes to supply and demand, suddenly with virtual visits, you start to almost wonder if there's unlimited to supply. So was that going to lead to huge increases in demand? And uh, if, if we do don't appropriately price these things, virtual visits could end up being a cost driver, not a cost savings. And I think that's something mm -hmm. we really think about closely because just like anything, like if, like if we think about uh, Netflix, when Netflix first came out, you uh, got these paper envelopes with DVDs into a mail to your house. You could have three at a time. Uh, you have to constantly wait your turn. You get the DVD, it might be sold out. Now Netflix is unlimited smorgasbord of content and you can get consume as much as you want. Yeah, virtual visits won't hit that point, but if it's at some point it could get so easy to have a visit that you start getting like somebody has a little itch on their, their hand and they're gonna say, I need a visit when what they probably just needed to do is wash their hands. So I, I, I question that, I'm, I'm, I can't really, comment too much on it yet because I'm still trying to figure it out with the data but like I do think that there is a little bit of a fear that utilization could go through the roof and costs could be actually negatively effective when you talked about mm. nurse practitioners or other lower level uh, 
like providers, I think there needs to be a move towards utilizing them better. Uh, I think there needs to be wider scope of what they can do. I mean, a lot of actually office visits you can see now, like the doc, you might not even ever see your doctor because they have nurse practitioners, physician assistants, they have other things that can take care of most things. So I'm, I'm actually a, a proponent of doing that, especially with the other thing that John just talked about a little bit ago is we do have a shortage of primary care physicians. Most primary care could be done by a non-physician as long as we're training them and overseeing them right. And I think the number one thing that could really help us lower costs in the healthcare system is proper primary care. It's, it needs to be primary care centric and that will drive a lot of the other costs. So I will go on to my next slide. And this actually goes right into that same thing and where I talk about care management. In the, in the US right now, on average, the length of stay in a hospital visit is right around five days. Under proper care management, that really should be closer to three days. Uh, believe it or not, in California, our days are, are well less than five. We, are, we actually are a more mature care management system. We manage costs a lot better than the East Coast. I work with clients on the East Coast. I talk about, oh, let's review your care management. And they look at me like I just cussed them. Like they don't, they, they are very super service. They are very, let people have what they want when they want it and let's do it. But uh, as this says here, that's almost a 10% cost savings by just managing the inpatient stays. Appropriate admits, like on average in the US, we're seeing close to 50 admits per thousand. And that really should be about 35 if things are done in the appropriate setting, outpatient, ambulatory care, different things. That's another maybe mm -hmm. 5% savings. Is, is that for a thousand people presenting? Is that what that, what is that denominator? Uh, it, that's actually per a thousand people covered, not even uh, like it's just, if you have a 50,000 covered lives, okay. it'd be 50 times 50 essentially of how many people get are, are in. Now, uh, ER, if you think about that, it, this, this, this comment here is as much as 50% is waste, or I, I don't like to use word waste, that sounds negative, potentially avoidable. Like, Half of what happens in our ERs today really shouldn't happen in our ER. It should happen in other venues. That, that alone, just the ER, that's one little line item on the total cost of care. Just getting better, and I think even the 2% savings is actually only assuming we, we eliminate 30%, not 50. So at least maybe 2 to 5% could be lowered just by using our ERs better. There's other savings that I just... Uh, other administrative type things or other care savings. It's another two, but you add all those up, we're at a 17% savings. Let's say it's even jump up to 20% savings just by managing the care better. Now, one thing I'll say on here, and there's, it's not on the slide, but two thirds of what we can save in the healthcare system is inpatient. It is hospital related because there's a lot of inefficiencies where people are staying, like they should be staying only three days in the hospital. Like let's say for a knee surgery or something like you might have to do overnight, but I just had a friend that had his ACL done and he did it outpatient. Like there are things like that, or it used to be mm -hmm. like you have a hip replacement and you stay in the hospital five days. There's still places in the U S where they're keeping people in for hip replacements for five days where I actually just had an uncle that had a hip replacement and he stayed one night and walked out of the hospital on his own the next day, full hip replacement. That's awesome. There's yeah. A, <laughs> where it comes down to evidence-based medicine, practice guidelines, where we need to, there's parts, just because we've done them doesn't mean we should do them. So if we've done, right. a, done a hip replacement one way our whole careers and we're a doctor in our 60s, like we shouldn't still be doing it that way anymore. We should be moving to what's more new and more efficient. So who, who, who sits in a position to move the needle on these? Is this like just really from the health system side or is there anything like employers and Really, I mean, it's going to come down to self-funded groups of the employers. The fully insured aren't going to be really aware of this stuff. For those employer groups, though, can they move the needle on this? Like, what things can they do? Employer groups definitely could move the needle on it. Uh, part of it is it comes with plan design, how you're designing your copays, your deductibles, that type of things. It also could be, like, flexibility in, like, sometimes, like, with larger groups, maybe having a clinic on site. Uh, it could be health and wellness programs. Like, which I know a lot of times it's been hard to quantify if they really help anything, but at the same time, like getting like 
uh, yeah, like concentrating on the, the chronic patients. I think a lot of people are like, oh, let's, let's, let's get the healthy people healthier. You can waste a lot of money getting the healthy people healthier when if you just concentrate on like essentially, I mean, 80% of your cost comes from your unhealthy people, concentrate on mm -hmm. their care. But uh, as an employer, yeah, there, there are things they can do. I think a lot of it really, the easiest way to do it is via plan design and uh, even working with your TPA or different things where they can help guide people to the right place and even having proper referral patterns and approval patterns, prior, prior ops, that kind of stuff. There are things that can be done and a piece of it for a group is keeping their administrator accountable that they are helping uh, making sure that they're trying to control costs too because if you have the hose wide open and you're spraying water everywhere like if you can just slow down the hose a little bit to get things at the right time by the right people to the right people that will really help so how do we lower costs we slow down the fee-for-service mentality found in healthcare. Like a lot of people view that getting more care is better when we really need to think about higher quality. We need to think about um, who like, yeah, higher quality, like sometimes that's higher cost. Going to a better doctor, a person with better outcomes um, can actually lead to lower costs because you have less problems, less readmissions and different things like that. There's a thing called value-based contracting or VBR, value-based reimbursement, but this is really where we held all parties accountable. Actually, I shouldn't say all parties, we'll get to that in a second, but like, this is where you look at like uh, a primary care physician, they are sharing risk on what happens in the hospital, which might be sharing risk with what happens with Rx. If you get all these people communicating, not being in silos on their own and working together and have incentives based on those things, uh, the cost of care should go down, the quality should go up. And there'll be less of like, that's why I have a picture of a vending machine here, less people going for whatever they want and low quality when they could go for high quality and what exactly they need. So uh, do the yeah, right. Well, the, regarding the, regarding the fee for service mentality, like the, we talked a little bit about it before we, we went on today is that um, uh, HHS's uh, healthcare price transparency rule they passed that hospitals are majorly pushing back on set to take effect next year. And I'm really interested to see how they figure that out because there's that the fever service game is just so complicated where there's these you know network discounts but they're based off of these charge master rates that are kind of just made up so that there's a back and forth you know markup markdown markup markdown game going on yeah so the transparency rule it's, it's interesting like the first effect would be obviously you know saying what the price is for something and there's already some clinics that do that you know you have some centers of excellence that focus on those things they say exactly what they'll do a knee procedure for um but you then think, okay, second order effects, it might also then lead to a little bit more transparency in outcomes, right? And so things like cash law, you know, trying to beat the Yelp of healthcare, that'd be pretty cool if we could know exactly how much we're going to pay for something and, you know, rates of readmission and outcomes and all that kind of information. Like I've got an HSA plan, but I can't really be a consumer because I don't know how much stuff costs and I don't know the quality of it. Yeah. You know, if I want to order pad thai, I look up the five pad thai places close to me and I can see how much it costs and what the ratings are, but I can't do that if I need like a multi-thousand dollar surgery. It's crazy. Yeah, that, that is a big piece of, I think that where we need to go to, like the reason they designed HSA plans is to make us be better consumers of our healthcare because we feel like we're paying for it, but we're paying for it without a menu in many cases. Yeah. We don't know the prices. We don't know the quality. Yeah, we don't have a Yelp where we say like, yeah, you're going to choose the five-star guy over the one-star one restaurant any day of the week. There is more and more transparency happening, but yeah, the, you kind of touched on it and we could probably have a whole nother call on this and maybe we should, is uh, how hospital contracting really works. Because like you, know, you talked about a charge master, every hospital can set like their, what they want to charge for everything. But in the end, it's a negotiation game where different people negotiate what percentage of that they're gonna pay. And uh, like Medicare pays a small fraction of what commercial people pay. Medicaid pays even a smaller fraction of that. So when these providers aren't making enough money on Medicare and Medicaid, what do they have to do? They raise their commercial rates. Who does that affect? That affects probably most people on this call. Like that, uh, like it's, so there is this game where there's different charge levels and then hospitals, even in the same network or say not the same network, but like could be neighboring hospitals across the street from each other. They're charge masters, which should say what it should kind of cost a little bit 
could be completely different. So if you have a really high charge master, yeah, you're willing to give a larger discount because you can end up at the same number. But like the fact that there is so many different uh, charge masters and totally different things. And it sometimes it comes down to how good of a negotiator people are, like when it comes to insurance companies, like there, that's, that's one piece where we could really standardize the payments across all payers, Medicare, Medicare, Medicaid. I'm not saying a single payer system, like have the government on everything, but having a set of costs that everybody plays with. And then we're competing only on quality. And that, that would be a system that I think could be more efficient but it would be a system that would rock what we do today. And the fact that it would be, mm -hmm. it, would, it would be so simple, it would be confusing because we're used to all the games they play. A lot of people might lose their jobs because they no longer need to negotiate these contracts as much because they just have a set uh, menu. But that, that is something we, there's a lot of views on this and I, it would be fun to have further conversations on, on that side. Uh, mm, yeah, yeah. Do the right thing at the right time to the right people. That's, uh, I mean, kind of close to the triple aim of, you want to make sure to get quality health care. You want to do the right thing at the right time. So do the right procedure at the right time, at the right point in the process of your care by the right person. So it's the right doctor and also to the right person. You want to make sure the right people get what they need. And how do we lower costs? We need to leverage technology. This is telehealth visits. This is alternative approaches. I work with a lot of startup companies throughout the nation doing different, uh, mostly app-based um, telehealth type things or new types of care. And it, there's a lot of things around the corner where it could really change healthcare. It could change it as employers adopt things, a lot of app-based things or technology-based things, or even new procedures. We're talking about those hip procedures. Like, yeah, be, be happy about this new one that can get you out in a day and not five days. Like we need to not just be, like I often tell my wife, like every year, instead of new year's resolutions, we often talk about like, Let's not just do everything we did last year because we did it. Let's look at things and see how we can do them different in the future. And I think healthcare, uh, I, love, I love this quote that I heard a while back. It says, healthcare moves too slow until it moves too fast. So a lot of times, like, like with technology and healthcare right now, I feel like we're behind uh, where, where we probably should be. And like, just like we saw in virtual medicine, we moved really slow in virtual medicine and then we had to run. So I'm hoping I can mm -hmm. do a lot of other things like hopefully we don't, uh, we can just keep on a steady pace so we're not suddenly sprinting and making mistakes. So advice to brokers, self-funded groups, even fully insured groups is don't overact to the good times. Uh, low cost, low utilization. Um, this last year increases were smaller for most groups, but you also want to remember that 2020 was an unusual year and we don't want to like think that that might be the new normal. At the same time, don't overreact to, oh, I guess that should say bad years. Not good, I typo there. <laughs> don't overreact to the bad years because uh, uh, healthcare is random. You're gonna have years when you have a lot of bad claims, you're gonna have years of good claims, but trying to keep a middle ground, like when, it, when you're negotiating, like if you're a self-funded group, if you're always saying, I don't wanna do any rate increases. I have some clients I work with, like they want 0% rate increases every year. At some point, they're gonna end up with a 30% rate increase because they didn't want to spread out their rate increases over time. Like kind of just being slow and steady wins the race. Monitor your costs as they go, avoid surprises. I think this is just proper planning. This could be projecting your costs well at the beginning of the year. It could be working with an actuary. Uh, if you need one, I'm here. Oh no, uh, uh, work with <laughs> working with your broker, work, uh, just making sure you're monitoring things and not just hoping. Like I think a lot of people just hope and that's good to have hope, but they're also, you need to do more than just hope. You need to be proactive. Optimizing plan designs. And uh, I think I'm getting close to our hour, but uh, optimizing plan designs and plan offerings. This is actually something that I've actually got a lot of calls on in the last bit here to help groups with is uh, making sure you're offering the right designs and even after offering if you have multiple plan designs, making sure that there's differentials enough in them that um, like you can actually steer people. So like I had a plan, I had a plan I worked with recently that offered three plans to their employers, employees. They were all platinum plans. They were all 92% plans. And they were wondering like, oh yeah, we created this new plan to help us save some costs. 
but in the end, all their plans were the exact same. Like they weren't uh, like I would I would say when we optimize plans, you look at your plan offerings. Like it'd probably be good to have a really rich plan that might have a higher premium, because that's going to attract certain people. Having a a more gold, silver, bronze, maybe a bronze level plan that could be free or really cheap that attracts certain people. Having an HSA plan, but finding the right mix, and you can do this in a cost neutral environment where if you were spending X and you want to have new plans. There's ways we project them out using benefit values, actuarial values, where you can come up with new plans that should be overall cost neutral to where you were before, but will leave you with more leverage to help steer people towards certain plans. And you might understand your population better and say, why are we offering such a rich benefit here when nobody utilizes that? They might be a lot better off by having cheaper co-pays on X, Y, and Z. So I think that's something to think about. Yeah, embrace and push towards technology. I kind of said that a few times, telehealth. And this whole thing of managing care. Managing care is the best way to save. I think a lot of people think just, oh, we're going to get better contracts. We're going to get our commissions down with our broker. We're going to get our, our TPA to offer us cheaper rates. Those will move the needle a couple percent maybe. But if you can really figure out how to understand your population, manage them, even get them to go to the right doctors, get them to go to the right hospitals, get them managing them that way, you're going to see a lot more bang for your buck by managing care, not just by negotiating care or costs. But uh, I guess that got to my last slide, but uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. If you have questions, anybody can feel free to email me or call me. And I don't know if we're going to open it up for questions now or we just are done talking. Yeah, I think I will leave it up for questions. So if you've got some questions, drop them into the box. Um, uh, we'll be on here for a couple minutes to uh, be ready for you guys. But yeah, I think the the last slide that you had there at the bottom on um, uh, what was it exactly like plan design with employers? I think that's always the hard thing. Like I had this conversation with an employer. They're like a you know couple hundred group out in Illinois, and they were wanting to know what they could do around some of those administration costs that are, you know. I said, okay, here's to be what to be realistic about. That's for you know in this case they were talking about something that was four or five percent of their spend and i was saying well what's happening to the other 90 95 96 percent you know you have no idea what's going on there that's where there's the meat that's the that's what we can really do to work on that's where we can make some progress yeah so but people you know they're trying to trying to reorient around that i think will be interesting yeah so again questions are open if you guys want to drop anything into the chat box um but, and Josh, uh, can I get a copy of those updated slides and I'll make sure I send those out to all the participants? Yeah, I'll email you right after. Yep. Perfect, okay, cool. Um, I'm not seeing anything in, so I think it's good to kind of call it. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, follow up with Josh. I'll send a follow-up email to everyone that includes his contact info and how to get a hold of him along with those slides. But Josh, this was awesome. Oh, we got one that came in. Can you detail? Can you detail the projected trend for decrease in COVID claims? Uh, say, were you saying that one more time? So the question is, can you detail the projected trend for a decrease in COVID claims? Uh, oh, referring to the bar chart. So going back to that bar chart where we had that spike in December, January, and then started to decrease? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I could, I could go back and I could reshare that slide. But uh, we, I guess, in the end, it, it's kind of a, it's hard to, exactly quantify what that trend is because it's a it's a multi regression trend i'm saying is where we were projecting lowering in um i guess it's a lowering in covid claims over time but it's also offset by an increase of uh both required and elective cases so it's kind of a hard one to like i don't have an exact percentage that it says it's going down over time but it, it was kind of a combination of all those three things coming together and just like I said, too, it's a piece of it that will kind of turn into required care as well. Even though it won't be COVID, there's a, a transition at some point where you don't have COVID anymore, but you might have some lasting effects that turn into required. So if you're looking for an exact percentage, like over time, it's going to go down 5% a month. I, I, I don't have that number. I can probably go back and look at some things. You can email me. We can talk a little bit more about it. But like, it's kind of a multifaceted trend, so I can't, yeah, there's not really one number to put on. Yeah, I mean, I would guess like a major thing there is because we are getting vaccines to the people who are kind of most at risk, 
I'm going to guess that from what you see from the numbers, like, like if you or I got COVID versus like, you know, my mom who's 68 or someone older who's like in their seventies or eighties, that's probably where a lot of the spending for a COVID case has been. So if they're the ones getting tested, we might only, you know, like, let's say in a couple months, we start seeing like a 10% decrease in COVID cases from a case count. I'll bet the spending is down even more than that because we're getting the, the vaccines to these like, you know, high risk people who if, if they get it, they're going to have a lot more spending. They're going to get possibly into the ICUs and a lot more care and stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing that's probably where a lot of that cost decrease comes. Cause we have so many people, they're just, they just sit at home for 10 to 14 days. Yeah. Nothing that's, happened. One other thing that I didn't say earlier too is at the beginning of COVID almost like if you were a severe patient in the hospital, in the ICU, like almost all of them were getting put on ventilators. We remember hearing all this news of running out of ventilators. The part that we haven't talked about too much in general, not just on this call, but is 90% of the people that were put on ventilators were dying, like actually dying mm -hmm. from it. Actually, maybe not 90%, but 90% of them, their condition got worse on a ventilator. So the actual process of care has changed completely now where very few people get put on ventilators anymore. And that's actually helping outcomes. And on top of that, yeah, mm -hmm. cases are going up, hospitalizations are going up, but we still can say confidently that um, severity is going down. So yes, we're seeing more numbers, we're seeing like higher numbers, but we're seeing less people actually get, I guess it, it, the severity is a lot less. I, I One last anecdote is actually this last Sunday, I went to church and uh, the person that I sat next to at church, I got a call the next day, they tested positive for COVID. We were sitting outside, everybody was wearing a mask. I had to go get COVID. Yeah. On, I went and got COVID tested, and I've been home on a quarantine, avoiding everybody until I get my results. But I was talking to him the next day, and his number one symptom was he had what felt like allergies and a cough. And he is a guy that is allergic to dogs and has allergies. And he his version of COVID that he got. Uh, literally felt like just an allergy attack and he's just been coughing some, but he tested positive for COVID. So it's interesting to see like, yeah, a funny thing is on, on Monday, Tuesday, I coughed a few times and my wife's like, ah, what's going on? And in the end, I, I, I'm actually expecting results back any minute, any, any hour today. But uh, that, that shows that the severity for some people, for most people is a lot less where I've heard of some people, yes, they're still getting put in the ICU, they're having low oxygen, they're having this, that, and the other. But there are a lot of people getting it right now that I think there's a lot of people that have it that don't even know they have it because they think they just have a cold or a, um, a little achy or something. So that, that's something interesting. And that's why we're doing this virtually because if I was exposed, I don't want to get any of you sick. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then follow-up question was, uh, just to reiterate, uh, you're still only expecting approximately a 1% increase in costs overall. Um, as you're considering pent up demand, but with COVID decreases as a percent of utilization. So those yeah. ones, as they're interacting together, the blend is a 1% increase in cost overall, right? Yes. And yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I'm kind of feeling that the, the, a lot of the costs, even pent up demand, different thing are kind of offsetting, but I do expect there still is most likely going to be medical trend. I mean, there is medical trend. Now, one other thing to keep in mind also is there is, this is a whole other thing, and I think you touched on a little bit with charge masters, but a lot of hospitals have had rough years. And a lot of them mm -hmm. are fighting hard to increase their, their costs or maybe lowering their discounts to, keep, to get more money to help make up for this past year. So we don't fully understand what all that looks like yet, but we are seeing, I mean, we have seen some insurance companies out very graciously giving, forwarding mm -hmm. money, helping uh, the, a lot of these providers, even I don't wanna say donating, but like helping out providers are getting in the game together. But we are seeing, like I've been involved in some negotiations with hospitals and different things where they are playing hardball a lot harder. So we could probably have a whole nother call on um, uh, what's the, there's a big push right now with um, reference-based pricing. And uh, yep. people are essentially moving away from things and getting into reference-based pricing because they think they could go and negotiate better, either via lawyers or other things. And I've kind of personally, and I, I guess we haven't talked about this, I hope I'm not stepping on your toes, but 
I kind of think it's a bunch of smoke and mirrors right now where people feel that they're going to be able to negotiate a lot better than the big blue plans that have lots of leverage. I think that coming mm -hmm. in, the reference-based pricing will be the small guy and we'll get a lot better deals. There's a lot to be learned there. We don't know yet. I've had some of my clients switch to it and where I've I maybe advised them not to. And I guess only time will tell. And uh, I know a lot of these reference-based pricing companies have big stories to tell. And in some cases they have been very successful, but like it, it's also hard to differentiate maybe just a year of good claim activity versus a year of bad claim activity. And it can look like savings, so. Right, right. Um, and then we also got a comment from uh, uh, insurance companies can only change rates so much due to MLR, so prices will play out. So, yeah, yeah I mean, the MLR is definitely an issue, like we talked about that. Once you tell insurance companies they can only profit so much per dollar of premium, they got to increase those earnings per share. <laughs> like they're, yeah. They got to appease public investors. So there's definitely a game that goes on there, which is, yeah, it makes it super tricky for sure. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I think that you mentioned hospitals too. The, the thing that I think is so interesting is like, you know, we use hospitals as this catch all term, but there are large major health systems that have multi billion dollar endowments. And then there's rural hospitals that are the ones that are really suffering. And those are the ones that really probably need these bailouts, per, you know, disproportionately more than, yep. you know, your multi location large health system that, you know, sponsors the local sports stadium. So, that's another thing I'm interested to see is how these rural hospitals that are sitting on like, you know, 30 days cash, yeah. you know, is, is that utilization going to get back up to them? So they stay around because if those go, that's a tough, that's a tough pill to swallow for some of these rural areas that don't have this high density. I'm used to in Los Angeles, someone wants your health insurance. We've got like a bazillion options, but some of these other areas, you know, there's not many players and there's not that many facilities. I've got a buddy. He lives in Texas. He lives in a hundred thousand person city. They don't have, you know, Cedar Sinai, UCLA, Providence. Like they don't have, you know, all these options. Yeah. So now that's, that's another thing to pay attention to. Is that could even be another positive is people leaving urban areas and moving out. That could help increase some of that. Like I know I live in the Inland Empire, like uh, not very far from all of you, but it probably feels a world away. If, but uh, we're seeing a lot of people move out to Marietta, Temecula, the Inland Empire, because they're able to telecommute now. And it's mm -hmm. causing like where we are have historically been a bedroom community where people are commuting to Orange County, LA, San Diego, all that. We're seeing more and more people move here. It's helping housing prices go up, but it's also, it potentially helps even our hospitals and some of these other places where they are gonna see some increased utilization, but that we're not even rural. Like some of these rural hospitals and disproportionate share hospitals and some of these outlying ones that they are literally hanging on by the skin of their teeth to survive. And uh, we do need to look out for them. Uh, one thing, when you talk about the MLR and these insurance companies, one thing I often like to remind people of too, in a good way, is like a Blue Shield of California. They have a maximum amount of profit they're allowed to make. And then they refund it back. And that number isn't very a very high number. So like the percentage that they can, they can keep. So I think a lot of, I, I hear it sometimes where you hear, oh, these insurance companies are making 20% profits. Like, they really can't. They really don't. If they did, that that's uh, it's not. Yeah. So it's. I think it's something for us all to keep in mind too. In a good way, is especially more non for prop, non for profit, but even the for profit ones have limits on the amount they can really keep. So that that's mm -hmm. all hopefully. Yeah. So all right, guys. It's uh. 12 after almost 15 after so uh, any follow-up questions reach out we're available but josh this was a great time thanks have a good holidays awesome. and uh we'll be in touch soon we might have to check in a couple months from now see how the vaccine rollout is going <laughs> Love it. thank you have a great day everybody all right thanks guys bye